Good evening. I'm John Hammer, and I'm coming to you uh, live from downtown Toronto Center Place, uh, where I serve as pastor of the Community of Christ Toronto Congregation. Um, we had scheduled tonight to do our regular Toronto Congregation Beyond the Walls uh, service, but we thought that it might make uh, sense to instead um, share with our audience here uh, who join us in our online congregation uh, and also anyone else um, who are members of the church or otherwise uh, in recorded form later, um, a presentation um, that I helped develop with the leadership of the Canadian church and presented at our different mission center conferences that we've held this year. Uh, and so I was uh, in Saskatchewan last month uh, for the Canada West Mission Center Conference, and I was in Guelph this month for the Canada East Mission Center Conference. And in both places, I gave an address where I talked about uh, what's called the Canadian three-thirds strategy uh, for the church, the church in Canada. Um, and I want to talk a little bit to you guys about that tonight, uh, because I think this is um, very vital that um, now that we have done a lot of the um, um, planning and thought work on this and also have done some of the initial testing and modeling in various um, expressions, this is the kind of thing that we have materials now to begin sharing with congregations across Canada so that they can begin to implement uh, a lot of the things that we have in the uh, three-thirds strategy strategic plan. So um, anyway, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, and we'll also be taking uh, your questions for those of you who are joining us online. And I know that a lot of people have joined us online. I don't know if you want to welcome people now, Leandro, or we want to do that at the end. Uh, let's let's do uh, let's do it later because I'm uh, I'm not seeing even my own comments on uh, on the chat screen. So let let's see uh, if I if those start appearing on the screen, and then yes, we'll we'll welcome everyone. So let's okay. go let's ahead have some and. Slides, then or me and slides. <laughs> All right, very, very good. Um, so what is the Canadian three-thirds strategy? So three years ago, Art Smith, who serves uh, you know, the priesthood role of apostle um, for different apostolic fields, including Canada, uh, challenged the Canadian church um, to, you know, to, with an idea or a vision of moving forward and renewal in revigorization in the 21st century. And he called this uh, the three-thirds strategy because it has three legs to it. And so I wanna kind of go over them all, all three in a little bit of detail tonight. So the first of these legs is one, congregations in mission. The second is creating connection. And the third and final uh, part, leg of the three-thirds strategy is new expressions. And we'll talk in depth about what each of those mean, but congregations and mission, creating connection, and new expressions. So just to kind of set the back work, or the framework um, of where we're at, uh, this is, we're not trying to be pessimistic here, actually we are very optimistic and hopeful, but the reality is that we are in um, a very uh, tough time for, churches, uh, and that's true um, around and across the developed world. So uh, we were reading a book in the, um, uh, the Eighth Quorum of Seventy, of which I'm the education officer, uh, by Alan Roxburgh uh, called Remaking the Church. And one of the things that Roxburgh, uh, quote from that book, he, he writes, uh, he's a Canadian uh, pastor and scholar who has been uh, thinking about the condition of what the, where churches are finding themselves in this century. So he writes, we are confronted with a historic break from what the church has meant for the past 500 years. There have been a lot of um, scholars who have identified this. Um, they essentially talked about how the inherited church that we have, um, everything that we kind of think of as church, uh, isn't is ceasing to be relevant or ceasing to be um, something that mo the majority of people in the developed world are looking to anymore. And so um, uh, Roxburgh here has likened though this moment of transformation 
um, that he is seeing in the church or that so many are seeing in the church in the 21st century to other great and important breaks in history when so much uh, changed and when in fact, although we don't see from this, with this perspective normally, uh, everything about, let's say, Christianity was different before and after these sort of moments of crisis or break. And so the one that's most recent to us before this one now, 500 years ago, uh, we just celebrated the anniversary of Martin Luther uh, half a millennia ago, who um, essentially precipitated the Protestant Reformation. What the church had been prior to that time and what it became after that time are night and day different. So uh, essentially now the things that we think of of inheriting, essentially the, you know, having the Bible in your own language, everybody reading the Bible, everyone doing their own kind of Bible study, that's something that we remember as an inherited practice in church. That was simply not existent prior to the um, Protestant Reformation when uh, Bibles were very rare, they were only in Latin, only the priests um, essentially read them. People with theological training uh, read Bibles likewise. Um, the focus of church was things like sacramental practices, the church's liturgical calendar, religious holidays throughout the entire year as people were involved with uh, saints and praying to saints for intervention, healing, all those sorts of things. Uh, and it became instead afterwards a focus on, uh, let's say, sermons, a focus on all the head and intellectual pursuits. And so it is a very, I'm just gonna suggest here, there's a very night and day difference between before the Reformation and after. And likewise, we can think if we dial it back further before that, the church that Luther had inherited was quite different um, from the church, for example, uh, that Constantine um, made as the uh, state religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, because what had ended up happening was that the Roman Empire fell and the church was then in a different moment of crisis again uh, when the state religion of the Roman Empire ceases to have a state. Uh, and likewise, the time before Constantine, all of the independent Christianities uh, focused around bishops and that as an, in turn also radically different from uh, the pre-Christian movement that Jesus and his disciples were uh, living members of before it was even called Christianity. So, I mean, I just want to just the point here is that, that the church has continued through all of that um, and there are night and day differences on either side and Roxburg and others and I as well uh, see ongoing uh, vitality and life and meaning and purpose for the church after this period of time that we find ourselves, which Roxburgh calls the great unraveling, when people have been abandoning all of their local institutions, not just churches, but all kinds of clubs, uh, civic organizations, uh, being part of your, uh, everything from your school board to a civic band to any of these kind of things, all the kinds of fabric of society institutions uh, that were, were totally part of the inheritance uh, 50 years ago have all been systematically being deconstructed and eliminated uh, in, in this recent time period or in our lifetimes. So what Roxburgh suggests here is that when we are at one of these liminal moments of total transformation, these breaks require the cultivation of a fundamentally different imagination and it has huge implications for the rhythm of life and worship in Christian communities. So. Here's just to set, set the stage if you're not, I mean, people probably are li largely aware of this, but in North America, so Canada in the United States, just as a survey um, that Roxburgh cites in the study, um, if people were asked, are you active uh, in a church if you, uh, for North American people? And so if you are part of that um, pre-baby boomer generation, um, the oldest generation that's with us now, 60% of those folks say yes, they're in actively involved in the congregation, 40% say no. If you go to that baby boom period, people born 46 to 64, 40% of them say yes, they're involved, and 60% say no. If you go to my generation, Generation X, people from 1965 to 1983, uh, that in that age range, only 20% people say that they're actively involved. And then the millennials and after, so people born after 1984, only 10% of them are identifying as being part of an, a church. So essentially this is a, um, a very rapid change uh, in terms of whether churches or are even relevant in people's lives. It went from essentially everybody uh, not too long ago to almost nobody, right? 
And this is also true for Canada, uh, Community of Christ and Community of Christ in Canada. Um, I serve as historian for the Canada East Mission Center, and one of the things that I did in, um, in the last two, two years ago in working on the history of the church in Canada is create these maps of where all the congregations are currently. Um, and I did that two years ago. Um, and the reality of it is in a study that a friend, a scholar of mine, a friend of mine who's a scholar did on community of Christ in Canada, uh, the reality is from the year 2000 until today, 50% uh, of the congregations that had existed in Canada um, no longer exist in that form. So either they closed or they amalgamated into, you know, two congregations amalgamated into one or that sort of thing. But essentially 50% of them are gone. And since I made these maps two years ago, um, uh, two of the congregations that I had drawn in have had to be uh, deleted from the maps. So the reality is that um, we are, we can say in, a, in the church, in a state of demographic collapse which is a very strong <laughs> word to say, but we also have to be very aware of the situation. We can't um, uh, hide, our, hide this from ourselves. The reality is, as we look at the congregations that we still have on the map here, and we um, give them a real hard look, if you look at your own congregation, um, how, how good a shape is your congregation in? How many um, in the congregation are non-engineerians, octogenarians, septuagenarians? How many people you know, are going to are going to be still alive and with you in in, in 2030? How you know what what's your strategy for going forward? So I'm not saying this to be bleak at all, <laughs> because what actually I'm very optimistic. And I'm optimistic because of the three-thirds strategy and the tools and things that we have. And I think um, there's also um, uh, amazing um, opportunity for continuing relevance. Uh, I'm going to quote here from the Gospel uh, according to The Simpsons. So Lisa Simpson comes at some point or other at a, at a very bleak moment in The Simpson uh, family. And she says, look on the bright side, Dad. Did you know that the Chinese use the same word for crisis and opportunity? And Homer says, yes. Christitudity. <laughs> so we have, I think, in addition to this crisis, there is a, also a commensurate opportunity. And we are at a moment of amazing Christitunity uh, in the church. Uh, because at the same moment uh, that we are seeing the collapse of participation in traditionally organized religion, there is now a commensurately vast uh, a number of Canadians, of people uh, in actually the United States of the whole developed world, who are now saying that they are spiritual but not religious, that they are uh, spiritual seekers. Uh, over, that's something I think that the same kind of studies are saying that it's 30, 40 percent of the population is now in that boat. Uh, and there are very few institutions that are around to actually um, be able to provide any of the kind of things that they are looking for. So uh, the president of the church, uh, prophet and president Stephen Beasy, uh, last year um, gave a, a very important um, speech to the church um, where he urged the church that it is in time to act, which is the name of the um, presentation that he gave. And let me quote a little bit from his uh, speech. So he said, as we respond to the unavoidable change in the world, so this thing that we're talking about, the demographics that I was showing you, that is not simply something about what's going on in Community of Christ, but it is what's going on in all organized religions uh, in the developed world. So as we respond to the unavoidable change in the world, simply persisting in typical church activities will not take us into the future. We need to adjust how we understand communicate, and live the gospel in a new time. So, so it is, it, we're not getting rid of anything. It's not saying we need to stop having the gospel, and it's not saying that we need to throw anything like that away. We need to adjust how we understand, how we communicate, and live the gospel in this new time. The future church, President B.C. urges us, is being formed by a basic concept. Our chief purpose is to birth, nurture, and multiply communities of disciples and seekers engaged in spiritual formation and compassionate ministry and action. And in a lot of the language um, 
that we have now in, from uh, Community of Christ World Church, from our scriptures, from the recent sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, um, there is a lot of talk about disciples and seekers. And the language here, I, I think, is meant to convey disciples. Discipleship are people who are already um, uh, members, committed members of the church. So they commit through membership to be disciples of Christ. Uh, but the seekers that we're talking about here are all of the other spiritual seekers who can be engaged with us in community in these kind of activities. So spiritual formation, compassionate ministry, and action. So um, with that uh, same urging that seven, President Vesey has given us, I want to talk now about how the Canadian three-thirds strategy that Apostle Art Smith presented to us um, does that, or tries to embody that counsel, uh, this time to act. So focusing on mission. Art is watching, by the way. Hi, Art. <laughs> um, so the idea of, um, uh, of the three-thirds strategy here is by focusing on mission, so on that missional activities we're talking about, the idea is to revive our congregations, to create connections with seekers, and then to, to form diverse new expressions of community um, that will grow out of this transformation. Um, the same way, like I was saying in history, um, everything was different before and after the Protestant Reformation. We anticipate everything to be different and every the way that we see a new expression um, at the end of, as we go through this transition. So, leg one, we mentioned, is congregations in mission. The idea of this is that disciples are nurtured in other words, the current members of the church we have, they're nurtured and the communities, our congregations are renewed through focus on mission. So missional focus. Two is going to be creating connections. So connections are created with seekers. So people who aren't now part of our, uh, member, our membership at this point, uh, new people that are being invited by sharing those missional activities with seekers. And then three, these new expressions. So the diverse expressions that evolve as disciples and seekers integrate to form new identity. In other words, not as we assimilate seekers and they just become us uh, and, or something like that. That's not the agenda item here. The agenda here is to walk with new seekers on the spiritual path together and to see the new identity and the new expressions and to experience and live those uh, that form. So let's look at each of these legs in a little more detail. So the congregations in mission, leg one. So for this, um, when we are looking at, um, let's say big picture, 20,000 foot uh, from the sky strategy, like we're doing, one of the things we wanna do is ask, okay, well, what is church? Um, if the church has gone through all of these uh, game-changing evolutionary moments when in fact it's forms uh, before and after different moments in history are absolutely different. What is it actually that we're even talking about? And so a lot of times, I think, in the inherited church that we have, we are looking at church and we say, whoop, it's the building. That's the church. <laughs> we're going to go to church. Uh, and so, in, so and in fact, also a lot of cases, those buildings have a very particular form and they look like churches, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so then in that kind of a case, um, one of the problems um, that we have as churches are um, in our society decreasingly relevant, those um, churches in the landscape also just completely fall out of people's um, visual landscape. You walk right past them or you drive right past them, you don't even see them, you don't um, see them as even uh, a vital part of the community. <laughs> uh, two. Another way we think of it now is in terms of the inherited church is that Sunday service. So um, it, there were times in the church and many people who are members of Community of Christ, their lifetime even, they may well remember uh, church as an all week long uh, thing. And so you may have had uh, testimony meetings on Wednesday night or prayer services then. You may have had uh, priesthood meetings at different times through the week, women's department. There may have been all kinds of other activities that were done. I know in the history of Toronto congregation um, in the 1920s and 30s, one of the big things that uh, the congregation did was they had plays. And so they would put on plays and they had a stage and they, and they, they did Shakespeare and they have, a, now we have all the 
congregation in costumes. So they did all kinds of, you know, you know, kind of amazing stuff that really was a, um, a week-long thing. They didn't build the church so that they could use it for one hour a week on Sunday. They used it so that it could be used throughout the, the week. But in so many cases now, church has really become narrowed to that Sunday service, and we almost think that that what we do in that particular time, that's what church is, and that's the only thing that church is. But what I'm going to argue here is that, in fact, um, the, neither of those things are the vital or defining component, but rather, um, as President Vizi talked about in his time to act, a definition is the community engaged in mission. So when we, as a community, or when we gather a community and engage that to do missional activities, that that, in fact, as opposed to the building or any particular uh, activity that we might do in the building is actually what it means to be the church. And so what is the mission? So we talk about the mission and initiatives of Community of Christ an awful lot uh, here at Toronto Center Place. We have the icons that we've made built into the wall uh, and we, for example, uh, recite them if you watch any of our um, Tuesday lectures. We begin always our uh, Tuesday night uh, history, theology, and philosophy uh, creating connection group by reading the mission initiatives. Um, you might notice though that we have said them a little differently when we have gotten comments about that. Um, and so for example, the first of these, invite people to Christ. What we say in our um, creating connection version of this as we are interpreting it in different ways or saying the same thing, we have used the word invite everyone into community. And, but I want to explain a little bit tonight why we are saying it that way um, because the um, official language um, in coming in at World Headquarters is invite people to Christ, right? And I'm going to take this opportunity that we are inviting people uh, into community to just do that with the congregation that has joined us today online. Okay. And uh, so let's see. I'm, at least I'm going to say hello to those of you who have already said something, because uh, otherwise I can't see you. Uh, so I would like to welcome Mary Walton from the Sioux in Ontario, Mary. Uh, Torque Steele um, from the U.S., Caroline Martin that is watching from Australia, and she, as usual, she sends us many butterflies, <laughs> uh, Ron Bogart also in the U.S., and we have uh, Art, Arthur Smith, which we never know where Art is, um, Gordon Hodgins, we know is not too far from, from Center Place, uh, here in Toronto, and uh, Maricela from Ontario is also with us, Pat Stokely, who I'm not sure where Pat is, if you're there, Pat, just let us know where you're uh, joining us from. Um, I have also James, uh, James Title. Uh, James is in the U.S., right, James? Yeah. I think. Uh, Ken uh, Wick, uh, Canton Wade Caswell, and I think I've seen uh, oh, yeah, James is in Indiana. I keep forgetting. <laughs> so welcome, everyone. I, I think that's, that's all I can see from now. So if I, if I miss you, please say, please say hi. I, oh, I see Michael Karpowicz as well, our pianist, um, who has provided the music for the introductory video. Okay, Pat is in North Bay. So oh. welcome, Pat. Welcome, Pat. Okay, so we're just talking about here... Um, we have talked a lot of ways, even right at the beginning of this, that part of the need here is to translate um, what we really value into uh, a language that people who we meet who aren't part of our tradition, who aren't, don't understand what we're talking about, uh, so that we can explain it to them using language that they can understand. And so for one of the situations with uh, the Latin cross and also um, with just the idea of Christ for many people who are not Christians right now. Um, there is a connection with the cross and, and of the word Christ with evangelicals. And uh, it just, depending on the kind of evangelicals, I'm pretty, pretty much meaning here essentially um, fundamentalists uh, uh, in any way we can kind of see pictures. Uh, this politicized uh, kind of fundamentalist Christianity that is existing, for example, in, it's all over, but in the United States that has recently been um, affecting the political system uh, there. And so my view here is that um, fundamentalism uh, misses the actual point of true Christianity, uh, and in fact, instead, um, worships 
fundament various fundamentals that they see as fundamentals anyway, that I see as more as idols. <laughs> And so anyway, we don't want me to make this argument about it, but essentially, uh, whether, wh whether they're Christian or not, the, qu the point of it is, is that they have contaminated the perception of Christ and the cross as symbols for the general public. And so people immediately first default, because they're so loud, think that that's what we're, anybody who is there are doing. And so although we, in Community of Christ, I would argue, have a deeper, more historically and theologically sophisticated understanding of the word Christ, it is nevertheless a jargon term, uh, and, and so is a symbol. And we also have, though, that obviously a claim on both that symbol and on the cross as a Christian tradition church. But the fact that our conceptions are not widespread is a problem for our mission initiative, which is inviting people to Christ. This can be quite self-negating unless we are able to translate what we mean into other words and symbols. And so in the Canadian Connection program that we're going to talk about, um, we have used, uh, instead of uh, the Latin cross, we've used the Greek cross, which is also a plus, which also indicates essentially positivity and also indicates, for example, adding, invitation. And so, and we have called that invite everyone into community and indeed um, being part of the body of Christ as we understand it in the church is also another way of saying community when we are talking about an expansive sacred community, a missional community. And so in that sense, what we're trying to do is translate to uh, the people we are inviting what we mean by uh, this first mission initiative. And so you'll have sometimes seen in Toronto Center Place that we also have, instead of the um, plus, we sometimes have uh, a starburst that has nine points. The nine-pointed star there is to represent our um, enduring principles, which we'll talk about. So invite everyone into community. The next mission initiative, abolish poverty and suffering, pursue peace on earth, develop disciples to serve. Again, disciples, a uh, wonderful word, but also having, is kind of mostly understood by Christians again. And so when we are here in downtown Toronto and a huge percentage of the people who walk uh, through our doors and center place have no Christian background, um, it, it doesn't, it, the word doesn't necessarily immediately have meaning to them. And so uh, we have said continually learn and grow is how we are meaning that. And, in, and indeed the last one, experience congregations and mission, living life meaningfully together. Um, um, again, through doing all of these missions, all of the, these missional activities. So um, the question then, in terms of whether your activities are missional, um, include invitation. So that very first initiative is invitation. And so the question I challenge and ask people uh, in our congregations that are struggling is, are you inviting new people to your Sunday service every week? Are you uh, people that you are uh, friends with that you know, that you are walking around with, uh, new people you meet? Are you continually inviting new people to your Sunday service? And I would say in most all cases, the answer is probably no. Um, this is not uh, something that we feel comfortable with. We figure people either don't want to be bothered about church or they already have their own church. So it, it actually our church service becomes then not inviting and therefore not fulfilling that very first mission initiative. And so this is one of the issues that we have uh, in the state of, like we called it, demographic collapse in the church. We're not inviting uh, and uh, very frequently and we're also not having new people coming to the one uh, function that we do with regularity in most cases. So um, with that though, we do wanna help with that kind of invitation. Uh, Parker Johnson uh, and Leandro and I uh, serve as the Canadian Church's marketing team and we have um, together and also in conjunction with World Church developed uh, a whole bunch of resources to help um, congregation with online tools that can really help with invitation, not only uh, for the new expression, for the new uh, creating connection activities and all those kind of things, but also for inviting people to your Sunday service. And we certainly use them in Toronto to invite people to come to church on Sunday. Uh, and we are going to be doing, we'll, we'll record that uh, presentation that Parker and I gave um, it is online from the CWMM website, but we'll, we're gonna make another recording of that. And we are going to have a workshop, I think in February. Yeah, so, February, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Yeah, so yes, we're gonna have a, an 
a workshop in February. I think it's going to be in uh, Bay Area Congregation, right? It's going to be here. Oh, it's going to be here at Center Place. Okay. So, so um, for if you are, for example, you're going to become, let's say, your communication specialist, or you'll take the, on this new role that um, we're proposing that people have uh, essentially a communications officer in their congregations or a social media uh, specialist. Um, if you're going to fulfill one of those kind of callings in your congregation and you're able to, we're going to have a Saturday uh, retreat workshop here at Toronto Center Place in February. We'll get you guys the dates for this when it's a little closer. And um, the idea of it will be that on the one hand, we'll have a kind of a, uh, we'll give some of these uh, lectures like this as we talk about what the possibilities are, but then it's going to be very hands-on where everybody brings their laptops and we'll just start setting all of these things up and Parker, and well, maybe Parker won't be here, but Landro and I will um, be walking around and just helping, you know, doing the different technical setup things so that Landro will, for example, help you claim your Google Maps identity and other kinds of important things like that. Yeah. So we'll have and, those uh, kind of tools available for people. Yeah, and we, uh, we, you, you mentioned Art Smith several times, and I would like to welcome everyone, and also I'm, I'm, I think I, I did miss Art, and he says, a great to be watching tonight, feeling wonderfully connected with everyone. So thank you, Art. Also, uh, since I last invited everyone, also Paul Quintal from Toronto has uh, joined us tonight. Hey, and Donna Fletcher, who I mm. forgot where Donna is. Uh, so if you're there, Donna, just tell us, please, where are you joining us from? So please continue. Very, very John. good. Okay, so we're still on the first leg, you know, of the Canadian three surge strategy. So this is congregations in mission. So the idea here is that congregations are focusing on mission activity. Uh, people engaged in mission is what we're defining church as. And so one of the um, tools that we have available here in Canada is a process called GROW. Uh, and this is a proven process that is helping congregations engage in mission. So GROW uh, is developed by a, a um, highly expert team in the Lamoni region, Lamoni, Iowa, and it's also been uh, rolled out there and has gone through all kinds of testing there, and then it has also been among many congregations here in Ontario. So it's a process where congregations set short-term attainable mission goals. So essentially you come up with a, a goal that uh, your congregation can do that has kind of a mission-oriented, mission-focused goal. It can be anything from something like a uh, a spiritual practice. So you're going to all say every morning or as many times as you can, uh, let's say the mission prayer. And that's going to be a spiritual practice of discernment that you're going to have together as a community uh, over the course of a certain number of period though. So let's say it's a three month period or something like that. Likewise, you might have a, a goal uh, where you're going to collect a certain number of cans for a particular food bank. And that again is going to be something over a certain amount of activity. And the idea of it is going to be invitation. So you're not just going to all get your own cans, but you're going to go around and, and tell people what this cause is that you're collecting it for. And you're going to essentially invite them to be participating with you in this wonderful cause. So in other words, it's, a, it's missional in that you're inviting people. And then it's also missional in that you're doing some kind of good within the overall context of the mission initiatives. But the grow part here is that it's short term, it's attain and it's attainable. And so then what ends up happening is uh, different uh, people in the congregation are designed different roles and this switches each time you do a new goal. So it's not just the same people in the congregation always doing the same things. So you also want to invite all sorts of people in the congregation who maybe you know, haven't been participating because they feel like they're not a kind of person who can give sermons or any number of the things that congregations normally do. And so one of the people in there is uh, a recorder who is recording all the progress. And one of the people is this communications officer that we're talking about who essentially celebrates the success uh, by showing, for example, you're recording it on social media, you're sharing it. At the end of your three, goal, three month goal or whenever it is, uh, you have marked all the progress that you've made out and you celebrate the fact that you um, have succeeded that in that. And so then from that foundation of success, congregations create a positive cycle of success and passion. So when you are doing kind of things, when people are engaged in some kind of new activity, you get excited naturally. 
Uh, when you accomplish something, you feel good about it. And when you build on success by having success and success and success, you create also ultimately a culture of um, that kind of missional success that has been often quite lacking. So a lot of times what has happened in our congregations as we have contracted, um, as uh, we have aged and grayed and we haven't been able to do many of the things that we've done, a lot of times we have beaten ourselves up. We think, what are we doing wrong that, uh, that we can't do all the things that we used to do anymore? And a lot of cases this has created a, a negative loop uh, that has caused us to have you know, a negative culture of defeatism and uh, despair. Uh, and the easiest way, uh, or the best way, uh, to actually then reverse you know, a culture of despair is to build uh, a culture of hope step by step by step, put one foot in front of the other, have a success, build on that success, and move forward. Grow does that, it's amazing. It has worked all over uh, Iowa and Ontario. So because these GROW goals are mission-oriented, the process is an amazingly uh, way to just engage this first leg of the Canadian three-thirds strategy. So we've talked about this being congregations in mission. When you are engaged in these missional activities, um, you're doing the first leg. And so to date, uh, GROW has had over 100 successful and these are all been measured because that's part of the whole system, right? So a measured mission initiative completion. So uh, people have set 100 different goals on different congregations in 20 different congregations that have been participating in Iowa and Ontario. And so I, mean, I have a note here that you can ask um, Art about it if you're in the CWM. If you're in the CEM, if you're in Canada East, uh, ask Tim Stanlick about it. Um, it's possible if you're outside of Canada, you know, it's also possible that you can participate um, you, know, you would ask your mission center president about it, I guess, is what, what, what that would be. So we um, have been very uh, pleased here in Canada with the, um, the success of the, the philosophy behind this. Uh, and so anyway, we couldn't, uh, it's something to think about engaging in in the first leg. Some yeah. folks are uh, wondering whether this video will be available uh, for uh, watching later. And um, as usual, all the videos that we live stream on Facebook uh, are available to rewatch once uh, the live stream ends. So you can find it on our Facebook page, Community of Christ Toronto Congregation. And this video will also shortly be available uh, on YouTube and also on our website, centerplace.ca. So you can rewatch at any time. And as um, Kenton will say, you can uh, show it to your congregation as well. Yeah, if you want to show it in your congregations. This is one of the reasons why we decided to preempt our regular Beyond the Walls because we feel like um, so many people asked us if this recording could be made available and it wasn't actually recorded at CEM. And so as a result of that, um, anyway, we wanted to do it tonight so that you have this recording and you can share it. So um, anyway, so if you want to participate uh, you know, as you're thinking out your strategy for participating in the first leg of, of three thirds, congregations and mission, GROW is a great uh, way to get going. So I'm going to show, though, <laughs> you know, in the first leg here, so we also measure here in Toronto. We are like uh, all the rest of the congregations in Canada, which is to say um, we are a small uh, group of committed disciples who come together on Sundays. And that, at a certain point, um, let's say as of two, the beginning of 2016, was pretty much the, what we did as a church and as a community. And so as you can see our... Um, our uh, attendance. Um, this is the attendance that we have at our Sunday service uh, back in 2016. Um, and, and essentially we have between 10 and 20 people usually on a, on a Sunday who are with us in person, right? And so that's quite normal and that's what, what so many congregations are, are facing in Community of Christ. Um, you can see in 2017 um, that more or less is held the same. We did have one um, uh, where a bunch more people came when we hosted uh, the Toronto Sunstone Symposium. And so many of the people from Sunstone came to uh, check out Toronto Congregation. But in general, on Sunday, uh, we're still staying in those numbers. And that has held true here in 2018. And so essentially, we have, you know, in terms of our disciples, a committed Sunday group. And uh, we've held that to about the same kind of attendance 
Um, there's been some new people that have come and there have been some people who've been reactivated um, and there have been a couple babies born, which we're very happy about. <laughs> uh, but in the same time, of course, several of our wonderful committed members you know, have also passed away. Um, and so this is just one of the normal struggles that you have in a Sunday service, even when you are using all of these invitational tools. You know, so um, President Vizi is saying we can't simply persist in what we're doing on Sunday in order to go forward. Okay, so that takes us to the second leg, <laughs> creating connection. Uh, and so this is the idea is now moving beyond uh, our group of existing group of disciples by sharing the missional activities that we have with seekers. So um, let's turn to uh, the most recent section of the Doctrine and Covenants uh, 165 verse 1f. This before it was actually canonized, uh, this was counsel that President Beasy shared with the church and this actually was the, um, the verse that we took uh, in Toronto congregation as our kind of um, blueprint for our own congregational renewal uh, when we created our renewal plan about five years ago whenever, whenever we started this. And so uh, here it is, let me read it to you. It's very action-packed and very dense uh, scripture here. Continue to align your priorities with local and worldwide church efforts to move the initiatives forward. So a focus here on mission, the mission initiatives. Continue to align your priorities with local, what we're doing here, and the world church, worldwide church efforts to move the initiatives forward. Additional innovative approaches to coordinating congregational life and supporting groups of disciples and seekers are needed to address mission opportunities in a changing world. So I think that this one little verse here <laughs> um, almost encapsulates everything that we've just already been talking about, right? So we have this changing world and it's a crisis, but there are mission opportunities here, right? So there's opportunities. A crisis and unity. It's a crisis unity. <laughs> It's almost in the scriptures here, Christ of unity. <laughs> so, you know, but additional in this to face this you know, opportunity, whatever, additional innovative approaches to coordinating congregational life. So it's not doing the same congregational thing, the same church thing that we've been doing before. Additional innovative approaches are needed for supporting groups of disciples and seekers. So we need to be um, inv inviting uh, uh, seekers in order to fulfill these mission opportunities in this environment we find ourselves. So the second leg here, it's focusing on outreach by inviting seekers to engage with us in our mission. So we call this leg creating connection and so this is part of then a creating connection program uh, that the Canadian church has developed. And so in this program, in creating connection, the idea is that member or disciple facilitators, people who are members of the church, host regular activities that serve as entry points, ways for seekers who aren't already in the door, who aren't already doing stuff with us, to connect with our community. And so these connection groups, creating connection groups, avoid the baggage that all sorts of people in the general population uh, will associate with organized religion. So we had, um, just here in Toronto, uh, 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 an hour or two ago, we had our meditation service, our Thursday meditation, and um, one of the people who came from couch surfing, he'd never been in uh, create a church before, uh, he, um, uh, you know, he came in and he looked about, about the place and everything like that, and he says, what is this place? And we described where we're at, you know, and he was very um, excited about, uh, uh, anyway, um, he was very excited about, uh, you know, anyway, the fact that um, he had come to a place where uh, he said that he essentially considers himself to be spiritual, but not religious, <laughs> you know, and so... I usually get to meditate with the people, so I never, and you get to talk to them, so I, I, <laughs> I never have a chance to, to, to you know, exchange these, yeah. uh, these ideas with them. And so we yeah, got to talk about Ryan. You're talking about right? Ryan. Ryan, talking. who came here and for the first yeah, time. And he tonight. came here for the first time. Anyway, so he said that essentially considers, he can see considers himself spiritual but not religious. Um, he otherwise wouldn't have ever crossed the threshold of a church, but he was able in our connection group to come and see this. And so I was able to describe to him and define to him 
um, what I think religion means and what I think spirituality means. And I explained to him that there's a lot of people, for example, who um, are still looking for meaning and other kinds of things who don't like the word spiritual. <laughs> so in other words, there's all kinds of um, places that people find themselves in. And we shouldn't let this kind of language divide us uh, from engaging in the kind of missional and meaningful activities together. Okay, so connection groups then avoid some of that baggage that is so prevalent. Um, so with our logo here um, for the connection group is these people that are also puzzle pieces where there's a missing piece that is being added in. And each one of these is meant though to align again with our mission initiative, so invite uh, everyone into community to continually learn and grow, abolish poverty and suffering, uh, pursue peace on earth and to live life meaningfully together. And so each one of those then interlocks in the logo there so that we are always having uh, for us, you know, in our identity, we're always remembering that what ha we have to be focused here on is mission. Um, and the last piece there that represents the seekers that are coming and adding to us, that's to remind us uh, that everybody's needed to complete this picture and specifically invitation is needed. So creating connection groups have to be mission oriented, but they can take any number of forms based on the talents and giftedness of the member facilitator. So some of the first groups you may have heard of through uh, in Canada here, we have a um, program called the Revitalization Ministers in Canada East. And the Revitalization Ministers, one of the programs that they have piloted um, has been, that has had a lot of success reaching out to, to seekers and engaging them in meaningful missional activity has been called either Coffee and Conversation or Conversation Cafe, uh, other kinds of uh, meaningful chat over, you know, it doesn't have to be coffee. <laughs> but in any event, you might have already heard of that. So that's one of the ways that connection groups um, have been forming. But there's all kinds of other spiritual practices that are possible. So we mentioned here in Toronto, the mindfulness meditation. Uh, there is a yoga group. Um, there is a drum circle where people are doing uh, the spiritual practice of native drumming. It's really an amazing one, actually. Um, there's a group that does uh, the knitting of prayer shawls. So there's all kinds of things that you can do. And you just have to make sure that while you're doing it, that you're being um, missional. So it's not just uh, gathering the same group of people to do all the knitting, but rather you have to be invitational. So you're inviting, if this may be a skill, for example, that people of all ages may want to start to learn. So you'd be inviting uh, people of different generations to knit with you. That while you're knitting around, you're having meaningful conversation on life issue topics, on topics um, that are related to essentially the mission, mission of the church, meaning life's meaning and uh, the value of community, all those sorts of things. Uh, when you're doing that um, all by itself, those things become missional. The, I mean, in the case of the prayer shawls, it goes, the mission goes on because uh, they're sent off to people that are in need uh, and they do more and more good as things go forward. So uh, essentially the idea is it doesn't have to be a one fits, a size fits all solution, but you just have to be quite thoughtful uh, in how uh, your activity is going to be missional and especially how it's going to be invitational. How are you inviting new people to do missional activities with you? So we'll just say, you know, the kind of the scope of this program. Um, so here in Canada East, in Ontario, uh, we have about a little over 20 of the creating connection groups uh, that have developed in the last uh, two years or so. Uh, and so you can kind of see on the map all of the different uh, yellow icons. I don't know if you can go to full slide. Did you do that already? Okay. And so um, the, uh, you can see, I don't know, there's the drum circle that's up in Port Elgin. Uh, you can see uh, in the area that's by Toronto there, you can see our, our theology group that's on Tuesday nights and our mindfulness meditation groups that are on Tuesday and Thursdays. You can see the little coffee cups all over the place for the coffee and conversation groups. Um, they have... Uh, a yoga one there and Stratford and one called Circle of Friends that has emerged in Sarnia. And so there's a bunch of different models that people are using. There's one called Faith Talk that they're doing in Barrie. Um, anyway, so it's exciting that this is already something that has been tested and we have already been engaged with it. So this is something that is not, you know, like you have to um, that there's no guidance for. We have um, workbooks and we have uh, other kinds of tools and, and, uh, and help with how to do the invitation to these that are available to you from uh, the Revitalization Ministers and also from us if you want to contact us.
So I want to talk a little bit about how the ones that we know the best here uh, in Toronto work. So our history, theology, philosophy group uh, that we have uh, on Tuesday nights, and if you are part of our online congregation, you may well um, know a lot about these already because you join with us on Tuesday nights, and our mindfulness meditation creating connection group um, that is on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but that we stream on Thursdays. So you might be more aware of the Thursday one. Yeah, when Mary Welton was watching now, uh, this uh, live stream meditated with, uh, and Gordon also, Gordon Hodgins, were, were uh, meditating with us earlier. Oh, okay. So a lot of people are participating who are with us tonight. tonight. So before I shared with you our, our attendance numbers for our Sunday service, um, but we also have um, our general attendance numbers now for when we rolled out um, these creating connection groups, the two that I mentioned here, um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the lecture group, um, history, theology, philosophy group was in yellow and the um, meditation groups are in blue. And you can also see we also have had um, the green or represent special events, so the baby blessings and also memorials. And so that's when, of course, we have the largest attendances uh, initially in the, um, in the congregation here at Toronto Centre Place. And so you can see we, um, right from the get-go, it's not like we're out of the gate, we're attracting enormous numbers of people to the meditation or to these lectures, right? So in a lot of cases, you have to remember when you are um, doing a new thing, when you are creating a connection group, um, part of the whole thing is you can't say, um, uh, you know, uh, that, well, you know, how, do, how have you been inviting people? A congregation will say, well, we had this amazing um, idea for a, a dinner. We invited everybody to do it. We printed all these invitations. We, um, we sent everything out. We prepared this thing. We spent all this money, all this work, all this effort, and nobody showed up, or very few people showed up. Or we did it once, and, and it was so much work, we never did it again. <laughs> so in all of those cases, that could be a wonderful event or a terrible sad event, depending on how, how, which, what happened in those particular cases. But, the, but the, re the reality is what you need to have if you're going to um, build a, an ongoing connection with seekers is regular programming, because uh, any invitation that you do has to be consistent and again and again and again. Everybody knows this from advertising. They don't, you don't see, you haven't in your lifetime seen 50,000 um, McDonald's ads because it only takes one to get you to there. <laughs> Right, in other words, that, that continual invitation is what happens to actually get people to actually go. We have had that experience here where people uh, come and they say, well, I have been watching your ads for years and I've always been saying I want to go to one of those lectures and it's only now that they've walked in the door for this particular one. Right. They've seen dozens and dozens of ads as a result That's of that. That's very common. Very common. But I always tell people how many times uh, I said uh, in, in, in this very room that we're right now uh, streaming tonight, I sat in meditation alone because nobody came, even though you know, we had invited people, in, in, even though we had set up the room and we had prepared snacks for everyone. And yeah. it's, of course, it, it's sad when that happens, but you cannot give up just because it happens once or five times or 10 times, you keep doing it. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is part of the thing. So to expect disappointment. <laughs> You know, I mean, I won't go through a, a whole thing to prepare a lecture and only a handful of people who you don't already know show up, or one, or none. It's still the same amount of work, but anyway, you have to do that to start building the activity. So this is our initial launch in 2016 and the numbers that we had, which are okay. Uh, but you can see then the second year in 2017, how um, this started to, you know, really take off as we started to have regulars who would come in again and again to the different groups and, and developing um, commitment with individual seekers and having them be regular participants of the community is really the goal here. And so you can see as that happens, the numbers, you know, begin to stabilize and going, or I'm sorry, go up in 2017 to the point now in 2018, um, we have reached uh, enough of critical masses in both groups, uh, the, the meditation and the history theology group, that we're, we're pretty confident that even when we, for example, uh, we get so busy that we aren't able to do our Instagram ads and this kind of thing, um, just the people who show up as regulars will still have um, the event be essentially our, large, you know, our largest event of the week through the regulars coming. And so one of the things that's happened, for example, in the, um, uh, we more or less 
three, three times here by getting into the, um, well, twice anyway, almost you know, in the 40s, that more or less maxes out the space uh, that we have here in downtown for in person. So we've kind of gotten to that place where uh, was what, what our goal was now already in terms of how many engaged uh, seekers we want to have locally. And uh, I would like to add that uh, this only reflects the people who actually attend here uh, physically. Yes. Because we, we're not even counting all, you know, the people like, um, you know, the, the audience tonight, all, all those, of, those of you who are joining us tonight, uh, we're, we're not even counting those numbers because, w w one, because it's really hard to, to figure out the exact numbers, <laughs> in, in, uh, including the, the, the fact that, you know, there's one of the latest scandals says that Facebook had been right. uh, just uh, lying about uh, all these uh, stats online. But nevertheless, uh, because uh, w when you say hi, when you say uh, w where you join us from and we see you there, uh, you know, that also we... Um, you know, these are uh, adds up to all these numbers that John's talking about. Right, and so in that way, so for the people online who are part of our online community who are watching us, it's a good point that Leandro's making. In talking about um, this creating connection, connection groups like this, we're really, we're really talking about the in-person group, and we're using this as an example for other congregations who want to make in-person groups. Um, the online stuff that we're doing here is another whole layer, and, uh, and so we, that's really important to our congregational mission, but um, we're not necessarily advising you know, that everybody has to do that as a congregation, whereas we are suggesting that everybody should do connection groups. <laughs> okay, and so just some of our numbers then, in terms of in-person people at Toronto Center Place, the number is probably more like 650 now, uh, since I made the slide. Anyway, it doesn't, anyway, it's over 600, which we're very happy with, obviously, that number. So um, the idea then uh, for us then is that new committed regulars, the most important thing, um, are part of the connection group. So that's more important than the overall numbers of how much, you know, how many people we might attract at any given moment who we never see again. Okay, so what we're just suggesting here is that our goal, despite the fact that we do like the top line numbers about how many people may well um, be joining us in person and things like that, that in fact, uh, the goal of creating connection is to generate um, groups of committed seekers who want to be engaged in mission with the existing disciples. And so this is what we have developed with our regulars now in the meditation group and also our regulars in the history, theology, philosophy, creating connection group here at Toronto. And of course, there's similar groups that are also in um, functioning across Ontario, co coffee and conversation groups that have developed regulars who come every single week uh, in that same way. So as connection groups now have spread across Canada, one of the ways then we've sought to harness is, harness, I'm sorry, the power of the church's traditional identity forming institution. So the reunion, which is a special inheritance that community of Christ has had for identity formation for over a century, for a century and a half. Um, the, uh, we would like to use, I mean, anyway, harnessing that same tool or that same process that we all have and love for community of Christ identity, we want to use that to build denominational connections across the groups. So all of these little creating connection groups are isolated, but as the members of those individual groups, uh, the disciples, sorry, the seekers here, come together uh, for creating connection reunions, essentially, um, we're able to develop another layer of uh, connection, another layer of identity with creating connection with the overall mission that we have here. So for example, in um, September, we hosted uh, our fall creating connection retreat at the Scientario reunion ground. Um, and we had 57 people who are mostly non-members of all backgrounds who participated in our fall connection retreat. Some of you from the online congregation uh, came and joined us and it was just absolutely wonderful because we were able to have then people who join us online meet in person and also meet in person with uh, regulars from the meditation and regulars from the lecture group here in Toronto and also then members from uh, across groups across Ontario. So, you know, essentially the point then in this particular leg, leg two, creating connection, um, then I wanna challenge uh, existing members or other people who feel um, interested in um, participating in this leg of the mission, ask yourself, what are your talents? What is your giftedness? What do you feel really compelled to do? And 
in terms of activities, and how could those be um, missional? So uh, including especially invitational. How can you invite other people to this thing that you could maybe be doing together that you could facilitate? So it doesn't have to be a theology or history lecture like I can give. I, we did that because I can do that. It doesn't have to be mindfulness meditation. Uh, Leandro did that because he went to uh, a meditation retreat at Kirtland Temple uh, that uh, President Vesey uh, was speaking at and it gave him the idea that we could be doing that same kind of uh, spiritual practice here. Um, it could be any number um, of other kinds of invitational missional activities uh, that you could facilitate in a connection group. Okay, so between those two things then, leg one, congregations in mission, congregational renewal through doing missional activity, creating connection, uh, expanding those missional activities by inviting new seekers to participate with you in them. Now we want to look at the third leg here, which is new expressions. So the idea here is that diverse expressions uh, will evolve as disciples and seekers integrate to form new identity. And so <coughs> unity in diversity is one of the enduring principles of community of Christ and of creating connection. And so this is our um, very interesting uh, symbol that we helped design to, um, to express it. But essentially the idea is that there are diverse people here or diverse backgrounds or diverse things um, that are brought together into this kind of, it's not yin yang, but there's, cause there's three, you know, a kind of a pattern. Um, but it's uh, in those differences that come together to form this whole that is more than the parts, right? And so um, the third leg then, uh, drawing upon that principle is supporting the emergence of new expressions of our community. So just as the church, we said, uh, the Christian church brought as, as, as a whole was radically transformed five centuries ago during that Protestant Reformation that we talked about, Christianity, if it's to be renewed today, requires us to translate our enduring principles and our mission in meaningful new ways in the, so that it can be relevant in the 21st century. Okay, so we mentioned, um, for example, the, uh, the connection retreat. So one of the things that we have anyway in terms of our identity formation and the creation of a new expression of community, that doesn't happen overnight. We have to do these things where we're, when we're in relationship with seekers, it's not that they're gonna get it or sign up um, the very first time you see them, but rather we have to build relationships of trust and commitment that are akin to the kinds of um, trust that we have built with our own disciples in who are covenanted members of the church, right? So it's not something that you just usually anyway flip a switch and suddenly you're, you're there. You actually um, are essentially involved in what is probably like a lifelong or at least a very multi-year long relationship I mean, our model in a, as a church is not to simply um, touch a little bit thousands and thousands of people, but rather to work in congregations of a few dozen people or less and, uh, and have them be very much committed uh, within that organization. Um, and so as we've already said, talked about, our tradition are, of reunions are already serving as useful tools for building those bridges and increasing identity with new seekers. However, so as we invite seekers to engage with us. Um, and so, you know, we have to expect transformation as we grow together. So the icon here, community engaged in mission and all the different people engaged in the mission initiatives. If you remember, that's how we defined what church is. Disciples and seekers engaged in missional activities. That's the definition of the church. So when we are doing those activities in a creating connection group, Creating connection groups uh, and getting into our disciples and seekers engaged in missional activities, that is an abate and switch. <laughs> this isn't a ploy that we do meditation on Thursdays with the hope that some of those Thursday people are going to come and show up on Sunday or that we have lectures uh, on Tuesday with the hope that some of the people from Tuesday are going to say, oh, well, maybe I'll go to their church on Sunday or anything like that. Now, some of them have, and that's been wonderful. That's no, that's not, we're not uh, saying anything against our Sunday service or not not finding it relevant and valuable and absolutely vital in the life of our congregation. 
But what we're saying is that that Tuesday night lecture is church. We are doing church when that's happening. Those meditation services that we have are church. When we are having church beyond the walls, when we are engaging with all of you, this is church. So it's, it, we don't ever expect our online um, uh, members in this community who are, are, are forming a vital part of Toronto congregation to all move here or gather to Toronto <laughs> so that you can come to church with us at 11 o'clock on Sunday. That's not- That would be wonderful. <laughs> But you can come and do it, please do. <laughs> We're not saying you can't, but in other words, our expectation is not that you need to. Our expectation is that we can be church with you by engaging in missional activities where you are uh, through these new expressions that have emerged. So how does this work? So we can only talk, since identity formation is a very long process, we can only talk really about our experience as we've had it uh, our new regulars that have emerged in the last two and a half years that we have been engaged in this kind of missional outreach. And so one of the things that is an identity former right at the start is regular participation. There are people um, you know, in our connection groups in person and of course also and online in our online congregation who are involved in every single time. So every Tuesday, um, some, people, some of the people who both do the meditation and also the lecture group, uh, they come with us for five hours of church often on a Tuesday. Uh, and that's just you know, a very regular part of their, um, of their spiritual life now. Um, we do this sharing of principles and mission. So it is not, um, not deliberate that at the beginning of the lecture, I, uh, as a ritual, read and recite to people and also give examples of how we are a community that's engaged in mission. Um, we share those all the time. We have them uh, ingrained in our wall. They're on the sign. They're on our cards. Uh, they're in posters that are on uh, in our uh, social room uh, so that people always have the mission and always have the principles before us so that we are, uh, understand new people and uh, you know, seekers and disciples uh, you know, understand what we're trying to do together. Um, again, like I say, identity forming artwork. Um, you can see behind me, <laughs> you know, every, every angle that you look in Toronto Center Place um, is about uh, trying to talk about who we are as a community, what our inheritance is as a people, uh, what is our vision uh, for the future. And so in having all of that, an intentional way of creating the sacred space um, helps to inform identity um, both for the people who've been around uh, their entire lives, 80, 90 years have been involved, uh, and, and also people who have just started joining us tonight. <clears throat> so one of the ways that regulars in our in-person um, creating connection groups here at Toronto um, express their identity with the group is bringing and sharing snacks. Um, we've had recently, uh, I mean, even upgrades of the kind of snacks that people <laughs> have been bringing. So, uh, it, some uh, Tim Mount Pleasant subway subs. brought a whole bunch of Subway subs for everybody on Tuesday. That was pretty amazing. We weren't expecting that. So anyway, but other people bring all kinds of, um, Terry brings, for example, um, all kinds of exotic uh, uh, vegetables and other kinds of creations that she brings every, every you know, pretty much every week. So anyway, we have, we have a lot of that. cheese, yeah. cake. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So there's all kinds of that. So yeah. helping prepare the church. So this is just you know, a natural part of a church community is you know, moving the chairs around. <laughs> You know all of these kind of things, and so people immediately now who are just regulars in the in the connection groups, they just that's their role. They they move those things around. They know that's something that we do every week, and so they need to um, investing through offerings. So we very deliberately in our connection groups um, have a uh, uh, played out, and we'll say even um, that our services are are viewer supported, our and also are for the online congregation, and also for in person. Um, that there's, a, you know, we suggest a donation. You don't have to because it's a, it's not, it's, it's you don't, it ties your free will offerings. Um, but, you know, this is how we exist as a community. So it's not a program where um, the Sunday community is, is meant to uh, have to bankroll, you know, everything, the new things that are being created and then sometime in the future we'll figure out how to pay for it all. No, we want people who are part of this community, we want to invite them missionally to, you know, again, the mission is to invite, we want to invite them uh, to be part of this missional activity of contribution. 
Um, newcomers welcome newer newcomers. <laughs> so not new, so committed regulars who aren't, let's say, members. Uh, when new people come in, they are able to say, well, this is what we do in this particular group. This is what Center Place is all about. Um, we get some of the most amazing testimonials that we always wish that we had a recorder on <laughs> when um, somebody who's a committed regular uh, in one of the groups is explaining to somebody brand new what the group is about. Uh, taking ownership but of the kitchen. Also the, the, thank you for coming. You know, as they as the new new people, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. new newcomers leave. Yeah, they're, as as new people leave, then people who are regulars, they say, well, thank you for coming. You know, so they're very they they have Taking adopted ownership, really. this sort of welcoming um, idea of the connection group that we have, and that has become their shared identity. Um, taking ownership of the kitchen, that's another kind of uh, thing that has very much happened. Uh, sharing other gifts, so people see that we have. Uh, you know, a uh, library, and so they bring books that are uh, of interest to them, and other kinds of things um, that are meaningful that they guest want to share. Guest lecturers, for example. Yeah, yeah. Guess we'll lecture. get to that. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I'm anticipating. <So, laughs> you're anticipating, yeah. So inviting their own friends and family. So our mission is invitation, and it's amazing how many of our regulars uh, are inviting people to our connection groups. How many more? Uh, how more frequently that happens than how many? times, let's say, existing members invite anybody to Sunday. I'm not you know, putting anything down, it's just very tough to invite people to a Sunday church service, whereas um, when you have the excitement of these new connection groups involved in missional activities, people just wanna bring their friends and family to them too, and so that happens all the time. Um, attending one of these connection retreats. So when you do that, it's like, um, you know, it's like you would say in a dating, in the dating world, if you if you've been dating somebody on three dates and then you suddenly go on a trip together, you know that counts for another ten dates or something. You know, so essentially going, um, you know, it's a wonderful identity formational thing to be part of a reunion. When in that 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 one um, point uh, reminds me that Maricela is watching and uh, she just mentioned that the September retreat was wonderful. So, oh, which good. I totally agree with Maricela. Oh yeah, we loved being able to. Well, we love Maricela, but we loved her that she was able to come to both that uh, retreat and also to our uh, uh, with the Sunstone Toronto Symposium that we that we sponsor in a bunch of our activities. So it's always wonderful when we can see. We love her here online, when, you know, but we also love to be able to be in person in those kind of activities. So asking for tithing envelopes. So people routinely um, make small donations or donate, um, uh, throw five dollars into the plate or something like that. Uh, even new brand new people or first timers, but actually what ends up happening as people become regulars, as this becomes more and more part of their identity as they come every single week, often they decide that they want to invest more in the ownership of their community by, um, by having a more substantial donation. And so they have therefore ask for the tithing envelopes so that we can also give tax receipts for it for them, you know, for those kind of contributions. And um, we and really even people who have, you know, uh, left the facility, went home and donate through our website. That's also true, yes. So there's a, there are all kinds of different ways that that's forming. Um, leading the activities themselves. So one of the ways um, that this has to be sustainable is uh, that over time, the new members have to be able to essentially lead the connection activities, right? The new um, people involved in creating connection. And one of the ways that that's happened in our theology and philosophy group is that people who hadn't been part of Community of Christ before, but who are very, very committed members uh, of the theology group have stepped up and have actually done the lecture. It's essentially like on the Sunday service being the person who does the sermon. Um, and then finally, one of the ways that has been um, really compelling and amazing and wonderful for us here in Toronto has been, and actually also I've heard many of the revitalization ministers tell similar stories, um, when is that members of the connection groups um, ask for ministry in ways that are very reminiscent um, of a traditional Sunday congregation. And so in the same way that that has fallen out of um, these communities, as we have translated this into new forms, nevertheless, that same vital connection um, that exists on our Sunday church, and church as it has always been, continues to exist in these new expressions, and the need for um, different kinds of ministry is still there, and people ask for that in the same kind of way. So a member of the, of the connection group who is of Muslim background, and she is a Muslim, she came to me and said, um, I think I need a pastor. 
Um, and I don't know about what it is because I'm not part of that tradition, <laughs> but I have a sense of it. And so we were able to sit down and, and, and do that kind of ministry. So I'll just mention um, then also again in terms of um, how is this funded? Again, we're not trying to, although of course long-term members, lifelong members, disciples, committed disciples are the bulk or have always been the bulk of contribu contributors to th of tithes uh, for Toronto congregation uh, in terms of local contributions. But you can kind of see as you kind of watch the, uh, the last uh, six quarters here um, of our uh, 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 local contributions that you know, that's the, the Sunday group is the purple um, but the uh, Tuesday Thursday group you know has started to become quite a significant component and you can just see as we've just started this year really um, talking to the online congregation that that has also um, they have also responded and we we thank you for it uh, with contributions and in fact there was a fairly big uptick uh, from online giving in the July August period, which is our latest uh, reporting period and you can see then in for the first time uh, uh, Just those two months anyway that the uh, Sunday group didn't hadn't uh, they're still contributing the same amount um, But it no longer constituted a majority of the contributions that uh, were given locally here in Toronto So in other words, it isn't that immediately people are paying massive amounts of tithing. That's of course not the case But how many congregations um, are there hundreds of? Um, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s who are making even small contributions that over time add up and also as people again are building that identity are essentially there has to be you know one step in front of the other in terms of that le le level of commitment that does and we have se been seeing emerging. Um, the top, the largest contributor to Church Honor Congregation last year is not a member of the church. We can just say so. Um, so it's just to sum up then in this new expressions and indeed this whole idea of creating connect, or the three thirds strategy. President Beasley in a time to act said, "The future church." is being formed by a basic concept. Our chief purpose is to birth, nurture, and multiply communities of disciples and seekers engaged in spiritual formation and compassionate ministry and action. So we our future church uh, that is going to be on the other side of the Christ of Tunity. <laughs> You know, as we, as the new expression has evolved, as we are doing church in all sorts of new kinds of ways, um, this is going to take the form, we believe, of groups of committed disciples and seekers who are engaged in spiritual formation, compassionate ministry and action. In other words, who are engaged in the mission, that mission that includes really fundamentally at the front of, on the front end here though, invitation. And so this is what we're hoping um, we have feel that we have been able to do in our congregational transformation uh, here in Toronto. But we also think that this is a model that is very, very doable for all of our congregations across Canada and indeed across uh, the developed world where people are facing similar struggles everywhere from Europe to uh, the Far East, Australia and the United States, of course. Um, and so that, <laughs> you know, in sum is essentially uh, the three-thirds strategy. Congregations in mission, creating connection, and new expressions. And so I think we advertise that we're going to take questions if we have had any. Yes, we haven't had any questions so far. And, um, you know, some folks have already uh, left uh, because uh, they, they said they're going to watch the 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 video later. Okay. So I think uh, for, uh, I suggest that for, for the questions, if, if anyone has a question like right now that they can uh, send it through the chat. Otherwise you can send the questions and we uh, just right here on the chat that will continue to be available yeah. uh, after the video ends. And you know, we will for sure, you know, John will answer the question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So in other words, the feed will still con re 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 uh, continue. I mean, if you, let's say, you, you may be watching us live and have watched us live right now, but many people watching may now be watching it, the recorded version. And so uh, go ahead and leave uh, questions and comments. All the comments will continue to you know, be available. In the, in, the, in the feed, in the stream there, and we, uh, yeah, in the Facebook comment section, and we will continue to answer them. So hopefully this has been um, 
uh, any way understandable and hopefully also useful and also hopefully a little bit of uh, inspiring and maybe just getting you know kind of the, the old noggin and thought processes working hmm what could maybe I do uh, one of my talents and giftedness what kind of missional activity um, could I be engaging in that could potentially be a missional creating connection group and so with that I guess we're gonna leave you and so thank you so very much for thank joining you. us. Thank you. We really appreciate it.